Matthew 28. We're going to read the whole chapter. Is that all right? Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is, has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while, they, while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Hmm. And Jesus said to them, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You all know this story. Let's do a recap real quick. Remember, Jesus was completing his work. They came by night, got the picture in your head? They came by night, they may have had torches, there were no street lights. So they came by night to the garden and they found him there along with his disciples. Judas kissed him on the cheek, betraying him. Then they grabbed him, took him out. He was taken to the jail. He was beaten, interrogated, tortured. Then the next day he was taken out as he was humiliated, carrying this cross, taken out back, so to speak, crucified, nailed to this cross and lifted up. There he died. Then he was taken down from the cross, taken to a, an already prepared tomb and placed therein. Three days later, as the story is told here, he rises from the dead. Take for a minute, just, just a moment, and think about how you would have felt for these couple of days. You've been with Jesus three years. You've, you've heard his teachings. You've seen what he is, is able to do. Now it's all over. It's all done. He's dead. Peter went back home. He went fishing. Others scattered. Some perhaps were cowering in some home, in some apartment, just afraid of what would happen next. Now he raises from the dead. If I were to give this sermon title, I would call it, Go Meet Him in Galilee. 
Go meet him in Galilee. This is what the angel said. This is what Jesus said. Come and meet me in Galilee. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about it. I know I never did. All I know is that the next verse that pertains to Galilee is in verse 16. And it starts out with now. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain that Jesus told them to meet them at. But it's not revealed that Galilee is 80 miles from where Jesus was crucified. 80 miles. I can only imagine the disciples standing there when they're told, meet him in Galilee. Yo, that's that's 80 miles. Peter's already on his way because, you know, he's from there. So he went back to the Sea of Galilee to pick up his fishing business as he had before. That's about a four-day walk. There were no buses. There were no Ubers. There were no trains. A four-day walk. If you were leisurely, maybe five to six-day walk. And you had two routes to take to get there. And, and as I found this out, I was like, why, why did Jesus have this predetermined place for them to meet? Go meet me in Galilee. They're already messed up behind what happened. They're already wondering. He said to meet him in Galilee. The message came to us, said, go meet him in Galilee. What's going to happen? Why are we going 84 days from now? Could you imagine what that four-day walk was like? We're going to meet the master. You you coming? Yo, Thomas, we got to get up to Bartholomew. We got to get to, yo, stop playing around. We got to get up to Galilee, 80 miles, four days from here. As I thought about it, I concluded, every time you find yourself in a mess, you've got to be, you need a moment, you need time to be refocused. You need some downtime. You need opportunity to come back to center. What better place for Jesus to do that than the place where they started this ministry? The first miracle took place in Cana of Galilee. There there were many people that came to him and and were healed of their diseases. Demoniacs exorcised, demons thrown out. So much happened in the region of Galilee. What a place to come back and recenter. They get there. They meet Jesus. They're by the mountain. And he recenters them. What does he say? He says, All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. That's the first thing he says. Now, now I don't know about you, but for me, that makes me feel real good. Because after all that happened, now he's saying to me, All authority, not some, all authority is given unto me, unto me. He's already demonstrated that authority in a big way. He rose from the dead. They've seen this authority before. They've seen him cast out demons. They've seen him raise the dead. That's not the first time. Lazarus was raised from the dead. The centurion's daughter raised from the dead. He has done this before. But he's putting the capstone on it. He's letting them know all the authority. This is a quiet church, (laughs) y'all. All authority has been given unto me. Amen? Amen. So he's saying to them, refocus. Get it together. I'm going to give you now the mission that you're going to be on from now on. Now, just to be clear, this mission doesn't just belong to the church. It isn't the church that came up with this. The mission was from the foundation of the world. From the foundation of the world, God put us on a mission. To bring all those who are lost, to reconcile all things to himself. That was the mission. All authority has been given unto me. All authority, not some of it, 
Not a little bit, but all of it. I want to say to you, do you know that if you call Christ Lord, this same authority by the Holy Spirit resides in you? Jesus was reminding them that this authority that he has, remember what he told them that what John is reporting to us that he said in John 15, 16, and 17, that the Holy Spirit has a few jobs, but one of the first ones is to give you power. Amen, lights. Amen. Can I get a witness to give you power? If you call Christ Lord, you have power from on high. You have anointing from on high. It's not just those who stand up here and sing and preach. Those of you who are sitting here, right here, right now, you have given the, been given the Holy Spirit with authority to speak boldly. Say that again. To speak boldly of the unsearchable riches, the incomparable riches, the, the, the same power that brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. You have been given that power to speak for Jesus. Why? Because all authority is his. Nothing can stand in your way. Even if you're afraid, think God has given me this authority. God has given me this power. God has given me anointing. Here's a word you don't hear a lot these days. Unction. Yeah, that's that old Church of God in Christ, Pentecostal <laughs> word, unction, right? You have that same unction, that same anointing, that same spirit power. Why? Because Jesus conquered. And he said right here to the disciples, to you, all authority has been given to you. Now, to, to do what? To do what? To go. I'm not going to do the therefore, but, but to go. He's telling you that as you go, as you leave this place, go around the corner, go to Brooklyn Barista, get a coffee. You meet somebody in there. Say something nice. And as you leave there and go up the street, maybe you have a car, you need, you need gas, and somebody needs help with the gas. Speak the word. Say hello. As you go along your way, as you live your life every day, as you go, share the gospel. Make disciples. Talk to people about who Jesus is. Go. It, it's not a special thing. It's not just me who stands up here. It's not Io, David, or anybody else who stands in this place to preach and teach. That's your job, too. Go ye therefore and make disciples. What's a disciple? A disciple is one who not only has been given the words of Jesus, they're a student of everything that Jesus has said and done. They are a devout follower of Christ. Not just a sometime Christian. Not, you know, maybe Christianity. You know, every now and then kind of Christianity. But right now, every day, all the time, a real Christian. For real. Too many Christians are sometime -y. Some Christians leave a place just like this after we've had worship and, and, and give God honor and glory, walk out and cuss somebody out. I've seen it. I've heard it. A lot of Christians have an opportunity to talk to somebody and mention Jesus and don't. I've learned over the years to stop on a dime and just pray for somebody. Can, can I pray for you? Can I, can I say something to you that and, and just do it and, and watch what happens. Watch the spirit of God sort of take over your mouth and you just begin to speak. But a disciple is one who is devout, a devout follower of Christ, a student of all that Jesus has said and done. Anything in between. Well, I'll let God deal with you on that. So, so, so baptizing, teaching to observe. Baptizing, teaching to observe. I want to give you an example of what this whole enterprise looks like. Go with me to Acts chapter 13. We're going to start there and then jump over to Acts chapter 14. Remember, I read this to you last time we were together. Just verse one, uh, nothing deep, 
See, all, all these teachers and, 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 and prophets were gathered in one place, right? And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them to, right? And so and further down, right, now you have Barnabas and Saul beginning to travel. Now they're traveling. They're traveling and they're going to different places to preach and teach and talk about who Jesus is, right? And, and they're on ships and they're off ships. They're meeting people who don't like them and, and trying, to, trying to kill them and, and, and trying to do all manner of harm to them. Then we reach chapter 14, same thing. They're traveling, landing in different places, preaching the gospel. Look at chapter, chapter 14, verse 21, verse 19, is it? verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. Here's the point, verse 21. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples. There's the example, saints. Preach the gospel, make disciples. Preach the gospel, make disciples. That's the mission. But now they backtracked. They returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. So they, they, they did a backwards move. Now they went back to where they started from. Chapter 13. After the Holy Spirit called them out to do this work, they went back. What did they do? Verse 22. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, keep that in mind, when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. They retraced their steps. They didn't just waste time. They went back after they preached the gospel. This, take, this took a couple of years. They went back, visited these areas, and they strengthened the souls of the disciples. What does that look like, Brother Pastor? Every time you go to a Bible study, every time your pastor preaches and teaches, every time you sit around with the saints and, and you are encouraged and you learn new things. Man, it was 80 miles from Jerusalem to to Galilee, man, I didn't know that. Every time you sit in counseling with your pastor or your Christian counselor, your soul is being strengthened. Now, this is what you ought to be doing. This is what we all ought to be doing, strengthening the souls of the disciples. So anytime you get together with other Christians, there should be some soul strengthening going on. There should be some encouragement going on. There should be some kind of empowering going on. Not only that, these disciples were strengthened and, and encouraged. But not only that, look at what they did. They went back to all these different cities in all these different areas. And they appointed elders in every church. Was it one church? No. Was it two churches? No. In every, more than one. In all of these cities, there were several churches. What are we talking about? We're talking about planting churches. We're talking about growing for the sake of the kingdom. I heard a theologian say something recently, and, and I was through this lesson. I was like, that, that's right. He said, if a church is not planning on planting or planting churches, that's sin. The church that is not planning on planting churches and not planting churches, that's sin. Look what Paul did. That's big, isn't it? Look what Paul did. Look what Paul and Barnabas did. They went back over the cities. I'm going to say it again. They went back over the cities that they had previously visited. Not only did they strengthen the souls of the disciples and encourage them that no matter what befalls you, be encouraged. Right. He told them, look, this is not an easy. This is not an easy thing. This is not this life is not easy. This life is hard. And he told them 
saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. How many of you have had an easy time? I'm up here with the oxygen machine. I ain't had no easy time at all. <laughs> right? I know a pastor who has been sick. Oh, my God. I don't know how she's alive today. So many infections in her body. So many things happened to her. The fact that she's alive today and preaching around the country. So if you think that this Christian walk is supposed to be profitable, you in the wrong business. You in the wrong business. So I'm going to say it again. If we follow the New Testament pattern that Paul and Barnabas through the Holy Spirit had, had created, had, had demonstrated for us, churches ought to be about the business of strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging and teaching them to observe all that they have been, that they have been commanded by Jesus and planting churches and setting elders in each of those places. Uh oh. What else should they be doing? Let's, let's, let's go back to, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 8, chapter 1, chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 8. This is what it says. Now, now, Paul is speaking to this church in the city of Thessalonica. And he's congratulating them. He's telling them, oh, what a good job you've done. Look at verse 8. When you have it, say Amen. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you, is the word of the Lord sounding forth from you, saints? Is the word of the Lord sounding loudly forth from you? Are you in the business of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ? Not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. That we need not say anything. Paul was like, I don't need to say nothing about y'all. The word of the Lord is going forth. What does that mean? <laughs> I think that what that means is that they are also strengthening the souls of the believer, encouraging the believer, and planting churches and setting elders over those churches. The word of the Lord is sounding forth. Not only that, but your faith, your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. So, so we're talking about now that not only is the church being built, right? Because you can build a church, thousands of members, <laughs> and, and nobody really know about it. They just know that a bunch of folks gather here and sing and shout, you know, and, and that's it. They don't know about Jesus. They don't know about, you know, all the things that Jesus said. Uh, nothing about uh, what it is to live victoriously in Christ. Some, some uh, are still doing that kind of thing. And, and, and all, this, all their members it continue to sin. Well, it's just like 1 Corinthians, right? Mm -hmm. but, but there's no strengthening of the souls. There's no, there's no encouragement in Christ. There's no building up. What Paul is saying is that there ought to be progress in the things of God. There ought to be elevation in the things of God. Making disciples. Don't you think? Don't you think, saints? Don't you think that the resurrection was an incredible bit of news? What do you think about the resurrection? We just read about it. The, the, the resurrection. I'm, I'm going to say that again. The, the resurrection. Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, came from death to life. That, that's a story. That's more than just a whole sermon. That, that's a story. That, that's something that if it happened today, 1 Corinthians 15 says uh, uh, that, that, that not only was this told of his resurrection, but 500 people saw him. If that happened today, because of our technology, right now we're online, you, with the potential of being all over the world, that story would have been, would have been front page news. The resurrection, y'all. Let me ask you a question. If the resurrection was a world-changing, 
life-altering event, why aren't we talking more about it? Why, why aren't we moved to do all that Jesus said? Why aren't we moved to, to proclaim the gospel? Why aren't we moved to lay hands, to pray for folks, see people get healed? The resurrection took place. It's not a myth. All the others, all the other prophets and leaders of different religions, they're still in their tombs, but not Jesus. And because that's true, the mission of the church is to make that known. Make that truth known that Jesus rose from the dead, that he secured for us salvation. He secured for us justification. We have been made righteous in the sight of God because of him. Do we believe it's true? Do we believe it happened? So, so that being true, that being the fact, oh, making disciples, we should be running out of here going to make disciples. We, we, we should be making, opening our homes. I'm not, I'm not tooting my own home, but, but before I went in the hospital, back in 2019, Shayla said to me one day, she said, you know, honey, she sat down, she was tired. It was like a Saturday night after all her women left from women's group. And, and she said, do you know that this week with the men's group that was meeting here, women that just left here, different people we've counseled that come by the house. We had almost 95 people come through this house in this one week. Come on, y'all. 95 people came through my house in one week in 2019. And that was just one week. I'm going to stay silent for a moment. I just want that to marinate. And, and I want you to ask yourselves, what am I giving up to make disciples? What, what am I making possible to make disciples? I know my fellow elder brother, uh, Tony Ray, they, they, their house is open all the time. Have barbecues, have, have worship time. There's people come on in the backyard it, with keyboards and, and guitar, and just people come and just worship in the backyard. How are we fulfilling this mandate to make disciples? But not only that, not only that, there are the ministries of mercy. Secondary compared to making disciples, preaching the gospel, living like Jesus so that others can see and his name be glorified. But there are also the ministries of mercy. Jesus fed the 5,000. And, and though he, he, he made it his business to go to the, the house of Israel, there, there were Gentiles that also came to him and he healed them. And he made sure that they, he, he cast out demons from them. He fed them. He honored them. He loved them. But don't, don't get it twisted. It, it, it's important. It is something, ministries of mercy, something that needs to be done. But it is not the primary reason for the church. The primary reason for the church is to make disciples. To build up the body of Christ. The primary reason, the, the primary purpose of the, now we can go to, to, to the Westminster Confession, right? Where it reads that, that what is the primary purpose of man, right? What is the goal of man? That to, to praise, to worship God, right? But, but, but you, we're going to be worshiping God. That, that's just going to be an outgrowth of, of our being in his presence, right? The angels in heaven, they just 
Hallelujah. Just all day long. The 24 elders just throwing their crowns and just, they're just worshiping God. Uh, Isaiah, right? They're, they're standing. Isaiah saw a vision and, and he saw all of them just worshiping God. So that's just an outcourse. That's just par for what we do because we're in his presence. But the primary purpose of the church is to make disciples, to nurture them, to build them up, to build churches, to build churches that make disciples. To build churches that strengthen the souls of the disciples and to, to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ. And, you know, when, when, you, when you proclaim the gospel, well, I'm, a bit, I'm a big believer in preaching in, in the parks and in the streets. You know why? Because it testifies and bears witness to the kingdom of, the, of Satan that he lost the battle. It, it reminds him, I read the end of the book and we win. All that you can do to me doesn't matter because we win. They, they, we win. So, so every time when you, when you teach, when you preach, when you lift up Jesus, it reminds the enemy. And I can almost see the enemy going like this. Man, you have to remind me of that. Look to your neighbor and say, say, look to your neighbor and say, say, go meet him in Galilee. Go, go meet him in Galilee. You need to refocus. You need, to, you need to, to come back to center. Go back to Galilee. Today is your day to go back to Galilee and meet Jesus again and, and, and reinvigorate the mission of the Lord in your life. Go back to Galilee and ask Jesus once again for another endowment of power. Oh, y'all you don't believe in the power, do you? Man, this, Lord, this is a quiet church. Lord, have mercy. I'm excited about this all the time. I want to leave you with this. I don't know the specific reason. I mean, I'll find out when I get there. This past week, we, we've encountered a lot of people that have family members that are right now, as, as I preach, in the hospital. Some of them have been intubated. Some of them are about to be intubated, put on a ventilator. Others have died. We know a sister on PA that her husband uh, came down with the virus. And, and he got sicker and sicker and sicker, and they were separated. The, ki the children lived with the father. The wife had moved out and established a business, and, but her husband got sick. Who had to step in? The wife. The children were upset. But, but as time went on, this man died. What, what a terrible situation. I don't know why, specifically, why God kept me. But I can tell you this much. The fact that I'm standing here today to proclaim the unsearchable riches of God. To, to, to remind you, go back to Galilee. Go meet him in Galilee. To let you know that if you haven't, you can now. Make disciples. Be about the business of strengthening the souls of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Be about the business of encouraging people. Be about the business of stopping on a dime and praying for somebody. Be about the business of Jesus Christ. God bless you. I, oh. Yeah, it dropped in my spirit just now. If you need, why don't you stand up? If you need prayer, if you need, come up right now for prayer. Doesn't matter what it's for, but if, if, if you're standing in need of prayer, just come up right now. Let's gather together as, as a body of Christ and let's strengthen some souls. Let's encourage some people. 
And let's start with us right here, right now. If you need prayer, come up right now. Just step out and just come right up and just stand right here. And let's pray together. Let's pray together. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. But, you know, you got some things going on. You got some things going on that you need prayer, that you need support, that you need your brothers and sisters in Christ to join you in calling out your name before the king. So if you need prayer, just come on up. Just step on out and come on up. We're not going to make a big, gigantic thing out of it because it's already a big thing. Amen. So just come on up and, and let us pray together. Let's pray together. Yeah, play that. That sounds good. Play something sweet. Great song. Praise you. Praise you. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you so much. Oh, God, as we stand here today, oh, God, we, we're reminded to meet you in Galilee. Father, we're willing to walk that 80 miles to meet you in Galilee, that we would be reminded of our goals, of your goals, of what you have called us to do. Like you called Barnabas and Saul <coughs> to the work that you've called them to. Father God, Father God, these precious souls stand here in front of you, oh God. You know what each of their needs are. Father, you know in the deepest recesses of their hearts and minds, oh God, what they need. Physical, emotional, just uh, life situation, oh God. We pray, oh God, we ask that you would help them to work it out. Some things they can't do by themselves, God. We ask that you would work it out for them. There may be some here who need discernment. Not spiritual, ooky, spooky stuff, but, but information, oh God. Because they have read your word, because they've spent time praying, because they've spoken to wise people, they are able to discern. They are able to decide between what's good and what's better. So, Father, we ask that you would help them with their discernment. There may be some here that they are in need of finance. Give them also discernment, oh God. Help them, oh God, to figure it out. There's some here that might need an open door. It could be just an open door to ministry, oh God. Father, we pray that you would open it. There may be some here that need a door closed. Father, keep them safe from harm. So close those doors if those doors, entering in those doors would harm them. There may be some standing here, oh God, that need physical healing, oh God. Father, we pray that you would speak to them, their bodies, oh God, that you would heal them, oh God, that you would begin the healing process. As the word says, that they, they will go through many tribulations as they enter and go through the kingdom of God. We pray, oh God, that you would help them to know that. Breakthrough doesn't always come immediately. Father, we ask that you would bless these people in the way that they need you to. And if any have not been in your word, I, oh God, I pray that you would help them. If any have not been in prayer, oh God, and on a regular basis, oh God, I pray that you would help them. Father, if any who have not been in fellowship with their, their brothers and sisters in Christ, oh God, we pray that you would help them. Because those are the avenues of grace. Thank you, oh God, for what you're doing and what you're about to do. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Papa's a lot taller than I am. 
<laughs> Thank you so much, Pop, for blessing us with that encouraging word and challenging us. Um, thank you. Um, I'm Nicole, for anyone who doesn't know. <laughs> Welcome to Joyway Church. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we like to shout out anyone that's here with us for the first time. Thank you for coming out, for visiting, for supporting. Thank you. Welcome. Um, if this is your first time, whether in person or online, uh, we like to just welcome you and ask you to text JVIP to 94000. Uh, just to connect with us, we like to get to know you a little better. Um, give you a proper welcome, a little more personal. Um, we have some announcements on some events that we have coming up. Uh, we just finished our Philippians in the Park series, which was great. I've heard great things. I'm not able to attend, unfortunately. But uh, pray that maybe some schedule changing, I don't know. Uh, but we have another series coming up. And our next series is going to be back in September, and it'll be on the book of Jude. So joining, join us for Jude in the Park coming in September. Uh, where are the fellas at? All my fellas? <laughs> All right, we have a great trip coming up. You guys are going to have so much fun. I love this place. Um, Y'all are going to Lake Welch on August 30th. So... You guys going to have a bunch of fun. I don't know what you guys are going to do, but I know it's going to be awesome. Uh, me and John, we love to visit there. Um, that's an awesome, awesome location just to hang out. Um, registration is open until August 22nd, and that will be on August 30th. So make sure you register and, and go out to that. Uh, block parties are coming. <laughs> Bringing it back to the block parties. Uh, they're going to begin Thursday, August 19th. Um, if anyone doesn't know block party, we're not like shutting down the whole block, you know, <laughs> we're not doing that. Uh, not yet. Yeah. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, but block parties are going to be, uh, just small groups, uh, during the week so that we can connect with each other, uh, during the week, apart from Sundays, uh, we're just going to hang out, eat, uh, connect, see how we're doing, and we're going to discuss the sermon from Sunday. So if there's any questions, we're just going to talk about it there. Um, all of these things you can register for on the Church Center app. And our last announcement is giving. So giving, if you feel in your heart to support us, to give whatever God has placed on your heart to give, um, it's really easy. You can give by text. That's what I do super easy, like super quick too. Um, you can text any dollar amount to 84321, or you can also give on the Church Center app. So when you register for all those events, you can also give at the same time. Thank you so much, Joy Wei. Uh, one of our pastors are going to give us the benediction. Before I uh, bless you, um, it's hilarious to me that you prayed uh, and had everybody pray because, like, the whole time I was sitting there, I just felt very, like, like, yo, know, Holy Spirit's like, we need to pray, we need to pray. Um, and I want to say something really quickly. I promise we don't usually do this. We usually soup on time and move forward. Um, but from now on, um, the landlord of the space lets us be here as early as 8 o'clock. We don't start setting up at 9 if you want to fully up to you. I'm going to be here at like 7.45, 8 o'clock every Sunday praying. I was here this morning praying. I put worship music on. I'll be honest with you, it was, for me, it was amazing just to be in here, just to pray, not to, wasn't here to do nothing. It wasn't here. It just, in an hour, we get ready. And I just wanted to pray and worship God. And it was a good time for, for me to spend that time with the Lord. If you're free, if you want to be here, the door will be open. Pretty much everyone in this room has my phone number. Just let me know, and I'll open the door for you. Um, but that's just something for you to know. Um, I'm going to just make that open to every single person, um, just so you guys know. It's always here. 
even if you can't come, but you know I'm here praying. Tell me what to pray for, and I'll be here. Um, but I want to pray for some things specifically. We prayed, and people came up, and we prayed for them. Um, but before I do, I want to give us a quick thing to be excited about because God answers our prayers as a group. Last Sunday, we prayed for um, Kimberly Grove's sister, Alyssa, who was missing for four days. Um, and that same night, she came home. That same night, she came home. God, you got to clap for that. That same night. That's wild. I don't know. I don't, I don't know you've been taught, but coincidences are real. Um, but God is. And we prayed and we reached out. We reached out to God, like begging, we said, for him to just bring her home. We don't care what the circumstances are. And she was home. I don't have much details. We're still praying for her, for her family and just like the, the trauma they all have experienced. Um, keep praying for them because that had to be a tough situation for them. But we thank God that that very same that very same day when the church comes together in prayer, God does respond. I truly believe that we came before him and God responded and she came home. And in that same way, uh, we all know we, we've been praying together for Sasha's mother, who's in the hospital right now. Um, she's been um, in the ICU for the last couple of days because she contracted the, uh, the coronavirus. Um, and man, Sasha knows better than all of us. Only Pop is the only other person to know as much as Sasha, uh, what it's like being in those hospitals in the height of all of this craziness. Um, and she's been taking care of her mother, taking care of family business. And um, so I want to pray for Sasha and I want to pray for her mother as a church. I want to do that right now. I want to spend that, that time doing that. And I also want to pray for, for her mom, Shayla, who uh, yesterday just crazily started getting these crazy, crazy pains in her back and she couldn't come to church today because of it um and i just i was convicted this week and that's why i'm taking a little longer of your time i was convicted this week when i saw a clip uh from a pastor named paul washer where he says they ask him the question they say what do you think is the greatest threat to the church in the world today and he said it's pastors um and as one of your pastors i want to be honest about something and i want to be real about something when he said if a church is prayerless, it's because its elders and pastors are. Uh, that knocked me on my seat. Because we have not prayed enough. And we do whatever <laughs> we focus on. Everything that any one of these pastors put focuses on, you guys step up to the plate and do. And so if we haven't prayed, it's because we haven't prayed. Um, and I want to come before all of you as one of your pastors and say, that's changing. Prayer has to be something that we need to be doing more than we're doing anything else. And that's why that space is open for you. That's why we're doing this. Um, I'd rather take a couple more minutes and know that it's going to take longer to break down and do all that um, because we need to get before God. We do as a group. And so we're going to do that for, for Sasha, for her mother. We're going to do that for Shayla. Uh, we're going to do that just for us as a church, as God has put us in this place specifically for Bushwick. Um, and like I say, and I've said a bunch of times, for Bushwick until glory, we're here to, we're here to sh show these people Jesus Christ and to show them the truth of the gospel. So if you, if you will pray with me, you don't have to just listen to what I'm saying. You can pray your own words to the Lord too. Um, but let's just pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for your character and your integrity. We thank you because you are good. We thank you, Lord, because you are kind and you are loving. God, you are faithful when we are faithless. You are good when we are downright bad. And God, in these scenarios, in this situation that we've been put in as a church, we know that you're faithful. Look what you did last week when we came before you and we didn't just ask, but we begged, we pleaded with you to bring Alyssa home. You were faithful to do so. And now she's home with her family and they're healing together and they're processing. But Lord, we know that it was your hand at work that brought her home to her family. What young woman goes missing for four days and comes home? The statistics don't say that that's the case. But God, we don't care about those numbers and those things because we know and we knew that you knew she, where she was and you knew how to get her home and you did and we're thankful. We ascribe that fully to you, all glory and honor to you in that situation. And so God, we know because we saw it that we can come to you as a church. And so we come on behalf of Sasha and her mother who's sick in the hospital right now, who's fighting the coronavirus. Lord God, would you be with her? 
where doctors and nurses can only do but so much. They're doing their very, very best. Would you do more? Holy Spirit, would you heal her body miraculously? Holy Spirit, would you show up in the hospital? Would you not just heal her body? But with the doctors and the nurses and every single person in the space, feel the presence of your Holy Spirit. God, that that hospital that she's in will become a tabernacle where you would be with your people, where you would be with Sasha's mother. God, on, on the behalf of your people here, we beg of you, would you bring healing to her body? Would her oxygen rates go up? Would she be able to process what she needs to, to breathe? Would she be able to get up and go on and live her life and be with her kids and her family and progress and love you and show you kindness and show you glory, God, in her every day life would you do that and for Sasha who is a rock for her family God would you give her the support while she is a rock God you are the rock would you hold her up on the foundations of your love your kindness your mercy and your grace would you give Sasha the strength by the power of your Holy Spirit would she feel the stamina your word says that you that we strive with your energy would she be able to strive with energy limitlessly from you that when she goes to work and when she's with us and when she's doing things for her mom God that she would not feel broken down and, and, and tired and dismayed but that her heart will be full of hope and joy and comfort from the power of your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you do that work? And God, for Shayla, right now, who's feeling pains in her body, God, would you bring healing? God, I know for a fact that's the enemy. I know for a fact that mom's out here trying to get on the move. She's trying to plan more things. She wants to disciple more women. She wants to do work for your kingdom. God, she's on the brink of retirement to start a whole new job just to work for you till she got no more breath in her body. And we know that the powers of darkness would do anything, would want anything to get in her way. So God, we ask you that you make that sciatica bow. God, that the pain in her body will, will become subject to your power your holy spirit that where that pain will come your spirit would bring healing oh god because we know that you can with the expertise of doctors and nurses and the miraculous power of your spirit will you bring her healing to her body god for us as a church forgive us where we were prayerless forgive us where we said we know how to plan and so we don't need to pray forgive us where we said we know how to do this thing so we don't need your help Forgive us where we had meetings, but we didn't pray. Forgive us where we had, I had debriefs, but we didn't come to you on our knees. Forgive us, oh God, where we did all of those things, but we didn't first come to the throne of grace asking for help. Lord, in those moments, you were still faithful to us. Would you help us to be people that are broken down, bent over in prayer? That, God, we would do exactly what Pop said. We would go and see you in Galilee. God, that we would come before you ready to do the work and ready to commune with you genuinely, God. It's not just read the word. It's read the word and pray. So, God, help us to do that. Help us to go and tell everybody. But as we go and tell, let us not forget to speak to you as we go. Help us, Jesus. And in your precious name we pray. Amen. Joy Church, would everybody just stand for me, please? I want to bless you as you go on about your day. Joy Church, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. May the Father give you unshakable and unwavering faith in the Son, Jesus Christ, as we find our rest and joy in him. Joy Church, you are blessed and you are dismissed. We love you.